This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. Going through the service call in the kitchen AC not working, and um, I'm actually found that the thermostat's all programmed incorrectly, but I'm not going to assume that's the only problem. More than likely, the AC wasn't working, and someone came in here thinking they were going to fix it by playing with the thermostat. But this one basically is set to turn the system on at 8 p.m. and turn it off at 1 p.m. And they set the cooling to 62 at 8 p.m. Like, yeah, it's all messed up. So I'm going to go back in here, change the whole schedule the way that I want it to, select every day, make it the same. Next, two periods. Building opens at 7 a.m. Building closes. We'll do 1 a.m. And then we'll set the cooling to 72. We're in the dead of August right now. Heating to 65. And then we want unoccupied cooling to there, that's fine. Uh, use default fan settings, yes, no, no, I already know it's right. So now we're set up and scheduled properly. So now we can go in, view schedule, turn on at 7 a.m., turn off at 1 a.m., okay? So we're done with that. Uh, and then let's go up top. I guarantee there's gonna be something wrong with the unit up there. All right, this is their unit. This is their kitchen AC. So let's open it up and have a look at what's going on here. So it is a Lennox Prodigy unit. You can't read that, but it says pre-cool. Let's uh, go into service. Actually, no, we need to go to data. Let's go, okay, so that's data. We're gonna go to history, alarms. We're gonna wait and see if it has any alarms. Again, I know you guys can't see this for whatever reason with this one, it's a problem. On 612, Compressor one, high pressure. 612 isn't accurate though, because the date is all wrong in here. So that's the most recent error code. If we want to see, what I can do is go to the actual, because here's what can happen on these things. If the date and time is not set correctly, then the dates of error codes can be incorrect. So we need to go into the settings right now and figure out what today's date is according to the controller. And then that'll help us narrow down on whether that error code on 612 was actually like yesterday or something. All right, what I did was I went into the settings. Again, I know this doesn't read to you, but this says June 14th of 2009 is what it thinks today's date is. So the error code that I did see is a recent error code of a high pressure situation. Let's have a look at this condenser. It is a little dirty. It's not horrible, but it is dirty. And then let's go over here. They're right next to exhaust fans, so it's kind of difficult. But yeah, it is a little dirty. It's also got some corrosion already. Gotta be careful. Oh yeah, that thing's plugged actually. It's not just a little dirty. That thing's plugged solid. I don't know if you guys can see, but inside. But that's also corrosion from the salt in the air. Wow, that's not good. Scrape on that. Look at that whole condenser's trashed. Wow, wow, wow. That's really bad. We are probably about 25 miles from the ocean. Um, so they do get a little salt in the air. And then it probably doesn't help that this AC is sucking up a lot of the exhaust fan air, which can be acidic too. So, all right, first and foremost, we're gonna start by cleaning this condenser. Then we'll go through the troubleshooting of the unit and see if there's anything else going on. All right, I didn't show you guys on film because you wouldn't have been able to see it anyways, but I went ahead and I set the time in here, but I found that it's like the whole thing was erased. I had to reconfigure the unit. I had to set the time, I had to set up the VFD, I had to set up the economizer, the model number, the serial number. It's like it completely lost its memory. Called and talked to Linux, uh, you know, they weren't really uh, too concerned about it. Once I reset it, they just, you know, we'll just see if we have any other issues with it. But we did that. Um, I'm getting ready to clean this guy, but a couple things that I noticed while I was in here working. Looks like we got a leaking 
Cormax fitting because we have oil all right here on the first stage. And then look at all these contactors. We'll open them up and have a look on the inside. Um, this condenser is trashed. I came over here and I hit it with water and look at like this happened when I hit it with water from the front. It just completely is disintegrating. Look at like it's done. So I'm going to try to clean it from the inside out. I do have hot water up here. So we're going to do that. And then uh, if I decide that I need cleaner, I'm all out of the yellow venom pack, but I do have some of the Viper HD, which is the same thing as the yellow venom pack cleaner. So that is micro channel safe. Not that this one's already destroyed anyways, but we're gonna go ahead and clean it from the inside out. Now, um, I do, like I said, a hot water and we have pretty good pressure here. So it's coming through, so it's looking pretty good so far. We're just gonna clean the whole thing and then we may put cleaner on it depending on how clean we can get it without cleaner. I already sprayed a little bit of cleaner on this guy, but I need to put a little bit more. And what you wanna do is spray it from the inside out I'm using the yellow HD cleaner. I did not add water. I'm just having it set on the least concentration. Their gun is formulated for their cleaners. And all that we're gonna do is just spray it on the inside, on all sides, and then we're just gonna let it sit. It's coming all the way through. You can see it's running through on the inside. You just wanna let it sit. That's the trick to the yellow cleaners is that you just let them sit there. They're not gonna hurt anything. It's just a proprietary mix of soaps and it does a really good job and it doesn't harm the aluminum. Now, if you use the blue cleaners, the blue cleaners can very definitely cause damage because they can etch the coil. So you never wanna leave the blue cleaner sitting on there. Um, and I have been trying to make a better effort of always being prepared and wearing gloves when you're using the cleaners and safety glass. Always try to make sure that I'm wearing my glasses too. I am not perfect, but obviously we need to take care of our bodies because, uh, you know, we only get one set of eyes, right? All right, now you want to let it sit for about 10 minutes and then give it a nice good rinse, okay? So nice and slow, making sure it's all coming out. It's difficult to get soap out of these micro channels, so you really need to rinse a couple times. Nice and good. And with this one, I'm pretty much just gonna rinse from the inside because the outside is completely disintegrating. Now, in a perfect world, we rinse outside and in, but it's gonna make the situation worse if I rinse from the outside. So I gotta do my best to get all the cleaner out. And then once I get all the cleaner out, then we'll run over it with the air blower to make sure we get all the water out too, so. All right, the unit is cooling. Um, I'm gonna have to get out of here for today. I cleaned the condenser for now. We need a new belt, and we need to fix this leak or figure out what's going on here, what it is, possibly top off the charge. But it seems to be working good. It's not going off on high pressure anymore. It just says cooling. All stages are running. I will investigate these contactors when I come back. I keep those in my truck, so if need be, it won't be a big deal. And that's it for today, so we'll be back. I am back today. We are going to finish up on this unit. So um, I had another technician come in and clean that unit, clean that unit, put new metal mesh filters in all the units, even this one, because they were all bad, and put new belts on everything. So we got a new belt on this guy. What I'm here to do is we're gonna fix this refrigerant leak, wherever it is, there's oil everywhere, so I'll spray it with some big blue. And then we're gonna evaluate the contactors because they've got that white powder on the side, so we'll open them up and see what they look like on the inside, and then just go through the rest of the unit. Now, they are still saying it's a little warm in their office, which this controls the kitchen and the office, so I will look into that too. Um, the unit is currently satisfied at the moment. So we're gonna use some uh, Viper Big Blue here, right? This is a leak detector fluid. This is their normal one. So they have an interesting mixture on this, and the biggest tip I'm gonna give you is spray it with the stream nice and gentle, like this, okay? See how when I spray it like that, it's just a, a thin layer, it doesn't create bubbles. If you use the fan setting, you can see it creates bubbles, okay? So I don't really like the fan setting because the really cool thing and what you're doing if you use the fan setting is you're defeating the purpose of the big blue because what's really cool about it is if you spray it on nice and clean, when you see clusters of micro bubbles, you know that's a refrigerant leak. But if you spray it on with the fan setting, like for instance, I don't think this one over here is leaking, so I'm gonna use the fan setting, okay? Look, you spray it on like that, then you see a bunch of clusters of bubbles versus over here, 
it's nice and clear. So if you see clusters, you know it's a refrigerant leak, okay? So I highly suggest you only use the stream setting on the big blue, okay? Because you're defeating the purpose of it if you don't. So it's been sitting on there for a few minutes and I'm not seeing anything. I'm pretty confident the leak's gonna be at the Schrader core, okay? We do have a slight little thing of bubbles right at the bottom, but these gaskets in these little caps, they're not really meant to seal a leak they're i mean they do a little bit of leak sealing but usually and there is a gasket in there usually though if there is a leak what it'll do is every once in a while it'll seep past the gasket especially on those plastic ones so let's go ahead and uh put a little bit of this right there and see what that does and there's my problem right there you can see how it's just bubbling out and if you look closely you can see a big bubble all right, so that guy is leaking and we are gonna replace it, okay? I have the tool, we can do it under pressure and then we'll top off the charge. All right, in order to change this Cormax fitting, it is a normal, I mean, it is not a normal Schrader, okay? You cannot take the Schrader core out. This is the fitting. The Schrader core does not come out. Don't try to take it out because you're not gonna get it out, okay? The whole thing has to come apart as an assembly. Now, it is under pressure. So if you don't have any refrigerant in the system, you can just unscrew it, change it, change the dryer back in the system down. If you do have refrigerant in the system, JB makes a tool, it's the Cormax remover, whatever it is, I don't know. You could go to JB Industries or something like that, just better, whatever it is. Um, I have no affiliation with them, but this is the tool. And what it'll do, once we break it free, we just gotta break it free right now. There, it's broken free now, okay? So it's not really tight, now we can put the core remover on there. It'll couple on, it grabs onto this little indentation right here, and then allows you to unthread it from right there. So I'll do it real quick. All right, I've got it off and I've got it ball valved off. There is refrigerant pressure behind here. There's the old Schrader or Cormax fitting right there. So we're gonna throw that one out. We got a new one right here, but before I put it in, I'm gonna put a little nylog on that rubber seal right there. Took a little of the blue nylog. It's safe for uh, POE and mineral oil, really. But the blue means POE oil, the, the red means mineral oil. Um, but I put a little nylog on the threads and right on there. Now you don't have to do that, but it'll help to keep the, the gasket lubricated. One of the things, in my opinion, about these high flow Schraders, these Cormax fittings, is that if you depress them down too much, oftentimes they'll get stuck and that's the biggest issue with them. So I'm gonna go ahead and assemble this guy back in there. We just slide it into this guy and then put it back on and it'll thread it in. I went ahead and changed the high side, which was leaking and the low side. Okay, um, I typically change them as a set when I do them. Now there is some on the other units. They're not leaking at this time, so I don't see the need to sell them unnecessary stuff. And the liquid lines don't have high flow Schraders. They have normal Schraders. So, um, I'm gonna go ahead and gauge up on this guy, but before I do that, I have the power off at the moment anyway, so I'm gonna go ahead and investigate these contactors before I just keep turning the unit on and off, on and off. Uh, I do want to address something too. You know, this is a really expensive tool. Um, I think there's prices as high as 800 bucks, as low as like 600 bucks. Yes, it is just a ball valve, and yes, a lot of people say it's unnecessary, you don't need it. You don't necessarily need it, okay? There is ways to do this, but in the field, you know, if if you wanted to not use that tool, what you could do is put a service tee on here and seal off that Schrader and then have two normal Schraders and then this one would always be depressed. That works, it doesn't look as good and it can cause problems in, if you have a lot of high maintenance on the equipment where people knock the service tees and you can break the service tees off. Um, but I've done it, you know, so it, it's not like I'm saying you have to use this tool, I just like this tool, it's cool. Now for me, this tool is easy. Yes, it does cost me a lot of money, but you know, subsidize the tool. When you sell the Schrader fittings, have a small fee in there for the tool. My tool's already paid off from the fee that I use. And then now it's just, I make a little bit of extra money when I sell one of these high flow Schraders and it's wear and tear because eventually I'll have to replace the tool because gaskets fail or something like that, right? So that's just the way that I do it. I'm not saying that's how everybody has to do it. That's just what works for me, okay? Um, so I have no problem buying a tool if I can use it and it's gonna save me time. In this situation, I'd rather not have to put a service tee on here and I'd rather not recover all the gas out of this unit. So since I didn't wanna go through all that steps, I just changed the Schrader with the tool or the high flow Schrader, Cormax fitting. 
So you tell me what you think of those contacts. They're pretty toasted, huh? Look at those guys. I mean, let's see if I can get a flashlight and show you guys better because I know the lighting's a little weird. Look at the inside of that contact. It's, uh, there you go. Yeah, it's kind of hard for the camera to see, but they're completely burnt. All of them. Completely burnt all the way across. So yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and change those contactors right now. So this is big picture stuff. I'm here because it had high pressure codes. Then I found a refrigerant leak. Then I found contactors. We're not here to just say, oh, the condenser needs to be cleaned and walk away. We're solving the problems, not the symptoms, right? The symptom is a high pressure code, right? Clean the condenser. But is that all that's wrong? Now, I've got the customer involved in all of this. The customer has given me approval, okay? So I know what I can fix on this equipment and I'm doing my best to get it operational. Got three new contactors installed. Torque them down. Looking good. Looking good. Cool. Yeah, these are all good. My uh, torque wrench in my elbow seemed to be correct because all of these that I pre-tightened are right at the torque spec. Yeah. It's kind of crazy the first time you use the torque driver and you realize how tight the screws need to be. But yeah, we're good. Looking good. So um, this is the uh, Weeha torque driver. I got it from True Tech Tools. If you uh, use my offer code Big Picture from TrueTechTools.com, you can get an 8% discount on checkout, and I get a small commission from that purchase that you make. So if you like the tool selection and their pricing, you get a little discount and you can help support the channel all right so we got new contactors installed i'm going to assemble the unit start it up and then we're going to probe up on it and check all the systems and then adjust the charge on the first stage if necessary for that little refrigerant leak now that refrigerant leak also was very small there was only a tiny bit of oil and you'd be surprised it may not have leaked out that much refrigerant oil goes a long way so we'll find out when we probe up okay so circuit one has been running for about five minutes. So I'm gonna let it run a little bit longer, but it does not look horrible. So it may not be, and that's the one that I changed the high flow Schrader on. So it doesn't look too bad, okay? Subcooling, I don't know what's going on with that. I wonder if my probe just lost connection or something. Let's scroll on to the next one. Circuit two, 17 degrees, super heat, 10 degrees subcooling. Let's give it some time. Circuit three, it's not running yet because it's only calling for first and second stage, so that makes sense. Let's go back to this one. 21 degrees subcooling. Let's go to, maybe it is something going on there. Let's go to my probe manager and let's look at liquid line pressure. Line one is saying 79 degrees. The other ones are 82 and 92 because it's not running. So that's not too bad. Let's give it some time kind of stabilize out looks like it's coming down or something something was going on so i'm gonna let it run for a few more minutes and i'm gonna get that third stage calling so i had it in test mode and it's weird because it shut off on high pressure there it goes it just shut off on high pressure again on the first stage look at that it shot up way too high on the first stage why is it doing that that's really weird Condenser's clean, condenser fan motors are running. Why would it shut off on high head pressure immediately? Like, and it had the high pressure. What is going on here? Well, what we need to do is we need to, cause I'm, I'm probed up on the liquid port and there could be a restriction. That dryer could be plugged up or something causing high head pressure. So temporarily we're gonna pull this guy and we're gonna put it on that guy, but I need to make sure it's zeroed out. That's really weird. Yeah, it's zeroed out on my tablet. So we'll put this right here. That's really weird. So we've got high pressure now. It's reading 320 and it's not running on the first stage. So what is going on here? I'm tempted to push in the contactor and see what happens when I hold the contactor in. Does it immediately go off on high head pressure again? 
All right, let's see what happens here. So I'm gonna let you guys see the tablet. I'm gonna push it in. Yeah. Immediately going off on high head pressure. Well, it's shooting up too high. It shouldn't be shooting up to 600 PSI on startup. What the heck is going on here? It was running this morning. Look at it, it's coming down now. See, that's weird. See, it was running this morning. Why is it, it's like it's got a restriction in it. it, it, it it's restricted slightly or something because now it's running fine. That's really bizarre, huh? So I wonder if I can get that guy to not trip. So I disconnected my jumper because I have it jumped out to the 24 volts. So I want to get it shut down and then we're going to turn it on again. I don't understand what's going on there, why it's doing that. Okay, we're connected again. So let's see what happens when it starts up. Yeah, see earlier it was running fine, but for some reason it immediately trips. That's not too bad now. It's going though, look at how it starts up high. But it's running now, that's really bizarre, huh? Oh, that's interesting, that's just the first stage too. Second stage hasn't come on yet. Yeah, that's really bizarre what's going on there. All right, well, I'm gonna let it run for a little bit and see, and I'll monitor it. I'm gonna check, once it's been running for a little while, I'll check the temperature drop across the dryer. Maybe we got a slightly restricted dryer. This unit is being, it's blowing my mind. So third stage, it's like it's not running. So I come over here to measure voltage, because I'm like, the compressor's red hot, but the contactor's pulled in. Look down here. The wire's arced out. What the heck, man? Like, there must have been a nick in the wires. And it didn't blow the breaker. What the heck happened here? Look, look. Did it, did it blow that hole? In the, I think it did because none of these other ones have a, a hole or a notch. Look at that. Go figure, right? It literally broke the whole line. That must have already been there. There's no way. I mean, I'll go and review my footage. Maybe you guys can already see it. But there's nothing that I did to cause that. It must have been just rubbing against that already, you know, because that's a crappy place. Huh, that's crazy. All right. This guy's still red hot, but let's check. I fixed the wires and I, I double zip tied these ones so they wouldn't rub out anymore. And then these ones I cut short and connected them. So let's check to see if the overload is tripped in the compressor. One ohm, checking all three legs. One ohm. One ohm, okay. Um, so the compressor overload is reset, so we should be able to start this guy back up and then further troubleshoot. It's still blowing my mind. I wonder if it's been like that the whole time because I literally have just been putting gauges on and stuff. But I changed the contactors. Was I that oblivious that I didn't even notice that when I changed the contactors? But I mean, I can't say that I was staring at the wires. I was just focusing on the contactors. Well, that's what we're here for, right? No harm, no foul. I caught it. So let's turn it on and see what else happens. So I still have a full call for cool right here because I have it jumped out. So we got to wait for it to start up. It'll go through a delay, I'm sure. One, two, three. All three of them running and it's running. Yeah, running, running. Third stage, again, it just turned on. Okay, but it's not looking bad. Let's go back to first stage. I still haven't done the dryer check on that first stage because I want to know why that sub cooling and that head pressure was going up so high so quick but I mean nothing scary evaporator temperature looks decent uh, superheat is being controlled by the TXV I mean we're looking pretty darn good except for that third stage I'm sorry that uh, first stage Yeah, the sub coin's a little bit high for the first stage. All right, I got a temperature clamp on the other side of the dryer, okay? So now we're seeing a clamp right here and a clamp on the other side, and we have no temperature difference. So one side of the liquid line for the first one is 82 degrees, 
and then the other side is 82 degrees. So there's no temperature difference. So with the sub cooling that high, I don't think there's non-condensables in there. I think the sub cooling's just creeping on this guy and I am wondering if it has to do with that deteriorated condenser. Like how bad it is. I mean, it's not horrible, but I mean, look at how it just disintegrates. So I wonder if we're not getting very good heat transfer through there. I don't really know what else to say. This unit's doing everything it can. Yeah, I, I don't think that there's a low refrigerant charge. I don't think there's anything going on with that. So at this point, I mean, it's running okay. We're just running an abnormally high sub cooling. And you saw how it every once in a while it would trip the high pressure control. I just think there's, uh, it's having a hard time moving air across that condenser is my thoughts, but all right, well, I'm gonna talk to the customer. We obviously need to talk to them about changing that condenser because it's rotting out and then we'll recover the charge, evaluate everything there. So that's pretty much it. So the more I think about it in editing this video and just watching the footage again, and even right after I stopped filming, I was thinking about it. I think that there's a restriction inside the micro channel condenser. I think that the deterioration is also causing issues, but I think that there's uh, something plugging up several of the orifices inside that first stage because we have good superheat, right? But it's it's intermittent. There's times, you know, that the superheat goes a little high, but for the most part, it's pretty decent the whole time. So I think the TXV is doing its job. We know that we didn't have a temperature drop across the dryer. Um, so I think there's an intermittent restriction inside the micro channel, but regardless, the entire front and back condenser to this AC need to be replaced. So, uh, when we do that, I would highly, well, my quote is going to be including replacing all the condensers, which I'd have to recover the charge from every compressor. We'll put new dryers on every compressor. We'll change the refrigerant in every compressor. Um, and then, then they should be good. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with the TXV. I mean, worst case scenario, I pop the top off and change the power head on the TXV, but you know, those TXVs, they're rebuildable. You can pull them apart. Uh, they're rather easy. So even if, you know, anyways, but I don't think there's anything going on with the TXV. I think it's a restriction in the micro channel. If you've ever seen a cutaway of a micro channel condenser, the it's literally like tiny little capillary tubes it's like each condenser has like 40 tiny capillary tubes they're tiny tiny passageways for the refrigerant to flow through so you know it's so important when you're doing work on these systems now this one has never been worked on uh i think i installed it in 2017 and uh it says my name on it at least i'm pretty sure i was there in some some capacity but um installed that in 2017 and it really hasn't been worked on or Maybe it was earlier than 2017. You guys saw the video. It's somewhere in the video. It's it's somewhat recent. I think it was 2017. But um, yeah, they already need new condensers. So what I would recommend to the customer too, uh, when I quote condensers, is that they let me go ahead and take them over to um, a professional coil coating place and have them dip the coils or coat them appropriately because they can do special coatings that make them last a lot longer in the, the the salty conditions that these things are located in now they're not right next to the ocean but this also just goes to show you how you know you could be 20 miles away from the ocean and the ocean breeze that comes through just comes and just deteriorates these things and i guess there's always potential that it has something to do with uh, the exhaust fans too but i have several restaurants from this same particular restaurant chain where we just get dirty condensers and they're not rotting away. So I don't think it really is mainly the grease from the kitchen stuff because it's the same at all their restaurants. And we have other ones that just get really greasy and they're a pain in the butt to clean. But when you clean them, they're not rotting away. So I think it really has to do with the salt in the air just from the ocean breezes that come through this area. So, um, you know, and it's important that, again, we don't just hyper focus on one thing. We're looking at the big picture, right? So came out intermittent problems, um, you know, customer saying it wasn't working. I saw high pressure codes. I know it was hard for you guys to see, but that Prodigy 1 display, for whatever reason, just the refresh rate or whatever it is, just doesn't work with the cameras. It just doesn't sync up. So every once in a while, if you get it at the right angle, you can kind of see what it says for you guys. I can see it clear as day because my eyes just work different than the camera. Um, 
lens or whatever. Who knows? I'm sure that someone in the comments will correct me on the way that it works. And please do, because I'm always one of these days. If you tell me enough times, I'll probably remember it when I'm explaining the process in a video. But, um, you know, we don't just focus on one thing. We work our way through. I have an understanding how the AC should work. You look at the basics. Is the condenser clean? Are the compressors running? Is the belt tight? You know, and then you work your way through that stuff. So as I worked my way through that, the first day I came out, I cleaned the condenser. I didn't have any more time after I cleaned it because it took a long time. Had to get out of there. Came back out, brought some contactors with me because I had a feeling. Opened them up. They were trash. They're actually sitting right back here. Um, I don't really see the need for an autopsy because you guys saw how bad they were inside there. But um, they're pretty bad. I always take those parts and I save them because I'll show them to my guys and stuff. And, you know, sometimes my guys will watch these videos every once in a while, too. So um, but anyways, uh, you know, we we got the contactors changed. But then I found that 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 open wire on the third stage compressor where it had shorted to the body of the compressor. And if you look on that lifting strap, too, it almost looks like a perfect like it looks like it's a factory little tooling mark or something on that but no it's because it blew a hole i don't think that happened while i was here i think that that compressor was not working in the first place i never really put my hands on the compressors i just heard noise and saw the contactor pulled in so it wasn't until today that i actually put my gauges on it and i realized it was single phasing so i think that the overload had been clicking on that thing for a while and i think that maybe in changing or maybe even it you know it could have been running actually that's more plausible that it was running but that um in changing the contactor i broke the wire the rest of the way like it probably was damaged but it was running and then with me changing the contactor moving it around it probably just broke the wire the wire the rest of the way because now that i think about it if it was single phasing from the previous three days ago when i was here and then till today like it probably would have ruined that compressor by then and it started back up. So I think maybe just when changing the contactor, it finally broke the wire completely. But regardless, it's that kind of stuff. We got to evaluate, okay? You got to look at everything, fix what you can, include the customer, you know, and get them taken care of, okay? So, um, you know, we can't always, I get these questions. People say, well, you know, how many calls do you get done a day? You know, and it's like, I don't know, as many as I can. You know, it, every day is different. I take it one call at a time to a certain extent, right? Of course, when I get emergencies, we'll we'll stop what we're doing. We'll get them running and then leave and go do the emergency calls, walk in freezers and things like that. But for the most part, I had a plan and I came out and I was on this AC all day. OK, I was here for about five hours going through the AC and uh, fixing all the different things. And then after that. I actually didn't do any more calls. I went back to the office and did some office work. Okay. Now my employees, they might spend five hours on one call and, you know, then do two more. So who knows? It just depends. But I don't go there and I don't say you have seven calls to do today that you have to do. No, that's not how I run my business. Okay. We start with one call and then we worry about the next one after that. And then we worry about the next one after that. And, you know, we, we, depending on, you know, um, the customer and stuff for the most part, you know, let's just say that I have eight calls today. Okay. And the customer called them in. I might not get to them today. I might tell the customer, Hey, we'll, we'll try to get there tomorrow. We'll try is the key word. Okay. I'm not promising them anything, especially for customers that don't do routine maintenance and don't have us maintain their equipment. I'm not promising them anything. I'll get there when I get there. And if they call me and say, when are you going to be here? I don't know. I got four calls ahead of you. So you know, I focus on one call at a time. That's just how I roll. I realize other places don't do things that way. Okay. So there's some days I'll get one call done. There's some days that I'll get five calls done. It just depends. I will say that more and more these days with customers not maintaining their equipment, we get less and less calls done in a day because we have to spend so much time cleaning, you know, and then we have to come back sometimes. And sometimes I'll even send my guys there ahead of time. If it's a store that I know is notoriously dirty, I'll send two guys there and say, go clean the heck out of everything. And then I'll come in and troubleshoot or I'll send someone else to troubleshoot, you know? So we take it one call at a time. We give the customer the attention they need within reason, right? And emergencies, we may have to pause some things, but I just take it that way. And that's the way that I roll. Okay. Um, so in this case, I'm going to give the customer a quote. I honestly, pre COVID, they would say they would just replace the unit because two condensers and all new refrigerant is going to be pretty pricey, but you can't get units right now. They aren't even building them until next year. And there's probably already a huge list for next year. 
So they'll probably end up fixing this one. Um, so we'll see. I'll give them a quote and we'll see where it goes. I really appreciate y'all. As I always say, thank you so much for making it to the end of the video. It is really awesome. It is really humbling to get all your support. Okay, so thank you. If you haven't already, please check out my website, hvacrvideos.com. We have merchandise available on there if you're interested in it. Uh, also have a few other ways if you're interested in doing so that you can help support the channel. Uh, you can support me via PayPal, Patreon, YouTube channel memberships. If you're interested in purchasing any tools, go to truetechtools.com. I have an offer code big picture on almost all the items. There's a few exceptions, but on almost all the items on truetechtools.com, you can use my offer code big picture. You will typically get an 8% discount. Again, there's a few items you won't. But if you do get the 8% discount, they give me a small commission from that. So it's just a great way to help support the channel. So thank you so very much, and uh, we will catch you on the next one.